Well, good morning. It's good to see you today, and I'm so glad that you're in God's house. Welcome to the 12 noon worship service, right? Yeah. Well, we have food for you. It's food from God's Word, and uh, we're going to be fed by the times that we spend in praising the Lord and in celebrating together. And the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to turn our attentions to the screens, and we're going to watch the celebration of baptism of two who've asked Christ to come into their heart. Let's do that. Good morning. We're going to start our service with the ordinance of believers baptism. And I have two young ladies following Jesus today. This is Joy Combs and she's trusting in Christ. Joy, who is Jesus to you? He is my Lord. Joy, on your profession of faith in Jesus, it's with great joy I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, rise to walk in newness of life. This is Madeline Shoemaker, and she also is trusting in Jesus for her life and for her destiny. Madeline, who is Jesus to you? He is my Lord. Madeline, on your profession of faith in Jesus, it's with great joy I baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, rise to walk in newness of life. Lord, we've done as you've commanded us, and still there is room. Let's join together. Let's worship him together. Would you stand?
Everybody said amen. Take a moment to greet those around you. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. so much. Would you please be seated? Well, we skipped right over autumn, didn't we? Went from summer to winter, but it's wonderful and beautiful outside. Thank you for coming inside, setting your clocks and being here to worship with us today. We've got guests in the house. 
from places far and near, and we're glad you're here. Please take a moment and fill out the tab in your program that asks some information of you, and then put it in the offering plate. It's the last thing we do. Put it in there, and we'll have a record of your attendance. A lot of our guys are away this weekend at a men's retreat. They'll be coming in a little later. And there was a big, big wedding last night in Amish country up in Pennsylvania. Sandy Kenyon and Jill Hoover spoke their vows. And a lot of our folks are still there, still celebrating, still on their way back home to us. But I'm glad you're here. And we're going to have a wonderful time in God's house today. I want us to pray. Would you bow with me? Lord, thank you for this gathering of your people. These are in the room and those that are watching and listening somewhere else. We pray you'll meet every need uh, of our people. And Lord, our agenda in these moments now following is to lift high the name of Jesus. And if that happens, then he will draw people to himself. And that's what we're counting on today. Receive honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. some things I may not know and there are some places I just can't go but I am sure of this one Let's stand together. Let's continue our worship together.
Thank you. Please be seated. It's been an exciting week in our city. We've enjoyed the things going on. Hope's been a good week for you personally. But I know in a crowd like this, it probably has not been a good week for everybody. Maybe the doctor gave you some bad news, or there was a death in your family, or some crisis, or a decision is looming, and it's Crunch time now, you got to make a choice which way to go. And you need prayer. If you're here today standing in the need of prayer, I want you to come and let me pray with you about it. Come on up now. us to remember today the family of Mitchell Killinger, 23 years of age, uh, died suddenly the other day, and I'm going to be doing the funeral tomorrow. 
at Jefferson Funeral Home. His mom has just started coming to our church and she's asked that I do that. So remember Diane Killinger and that family and the loss of her son. Phyllis Gardner's sister passed away. Suzanne Morrison's mother has died in recent days. So we know they need our prayers and support. Let's remember the Kenyans as they begin their life together, that God will bless them in every way. Join me now. Father, thank you for loving us the way you do. And in happy times and in sad, we come to you for your touch. We need you, Lord, we need you. Every hour, we need you. So give comfort and give healing, strength, deliverance, and guidance. Be with our men coming back from retreat, and we pray that what they experience there will bless them for many days to come. And for new marriages starting, Lord, we ask your special grace and blessing. We commit all of our lives to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite your attention to the New Testament book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Today we're talking about spiritual formation, how it is that we grow in the Lord. And inside your program, if you're new to First Baptist, there is a listening guide, a, a helpful outline. It may be helpful, maybe not. If it isn't, then put it away. But if it helps you listen better, get it out and fill in those blanks as we move through the message this morning. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And in these verses, the, the part that's really familiar to you, we find an ancient Christian hymn. They sang hymns in their churches, and we don't have the music anymore, but we've got the lyrics, and we think this is one of them, beginning down in verse 5. But let's us start in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, the point is he's calling us to a life of community and unity, and he uses as an example these verses. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross." Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, the father, God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. We're talking about spiritual formation. You know, an architect lays out plans for a building uh, like the one we're doing. And at first, it's just a dream. And then it's lines on paper. But eventually, in the process of time, an actual building emerges. And you couldn't help but notice as you pulled in this morning, the progress that's being made on our building. It's happening. The walls are coming up. And next week you'll see more and the windows will be in soon. And then the interior work really gets going. We pray and hope 
that by late, late spring, maybe the first part of June, we will be in that building. But it started as an architect's dream, our ideas on paper, and now it has to come into being. The story is told, and I don't know if it's true or not. Some say it is, some say it isn't. The story is told of the great, magnificent Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai, formerly Bombay, India. It was built in 1903. It still stands. A blend of elegance and history. It is the uh, window to India. It's right there on the bay. 500 rooms, six stories. Maybe you've stayed there. I don't know. I never have, but it's beautiful. The architect built it with in mind having the rooms facing the beautiful bay and the entrance would come in from the city side. He went away on a journey while the building was being completed and when he got back to town as his boat is coming into the bay, he looks and he is aghast at what he sees. The builders, the contractors had taken his plan and turned it completely around. Now the rooms, instead of a beautiful view of the bay, have a view of the city of Bombay. He was devastated by it. He had a plan, but the contractors built it differently. We're watching out for hours. Well, hopefully that won't happen to us. The plan needs to be finished. Now, God has a plan for you. And God has a plan for me. He's the great architect and he's laid it all out, but now it is for you and for me to build. And hopefully what results equals the lines on the paper. God's plan for your life and my life is that one day we resemble Jesus. And so point number one, our pursuit in this life is Christ-likeness. Now, maybe you're pursuing a lot of things, your career, money, pleasure, all kinds of pursuits in this world. But we are to pursue one thing, and then everything else is subsumed under that, Christ-likeness. Galatians chapter 4. Just go back a little bit. Galatians chapter 4, verse 18. Paul is rebuking the Galatian Christians. They've been, have allowed themselves to be deceived and they're pursuing other things. Verse 18 of chapter 4. It is, it is fine to be zealous. They were that. It's fine to be zealous provided the purpose is good. And to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. There it is. The pursuit. There are many in this life, but there's one that we have higher than any other. And that is Christ's likeness, that Christ be formed in us. In another place, Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, he uses an unusual image in this verse. He, we, we're accustomed to Paul talking as a father to his children, but here he speaks as if he's a mother. He takes a female uh, uh, analogy. He says, I'm like a mother, and I birthed you, and I'm willing to do it again. I'm willing to go through all of that pain of childbirth until you are formed, and Christ is formed in you. He says, my little children, and that's a term of endearment. He's softening perhaps the rebuke, or maybe he's still rebuking them. When he calls them little children, he may be saying you're acting childish. It's one thing to be childlike. That's how we come to faith in Christ. It's altogether different to be childish. We're to grow up in Christ and let Jesus be formed in us. Our world wants to know God. They, they, they've heard about Jesus and, and they like what they hear about him, but they don't see Jesus. And so they ought to be able to think that if they can be with somebody who's been with Jesus, they could see Jesus. And that's where you come in. We've been with the Lord and as Christ is formed in us, others can see him. That is our pursuit. Make it your number one pursuit, Christ-likeness. Now, the question is, how do we get there? And it is a long process. 
The process is long. It is lifelong. You're never completely there until this life is over. You are in the process. And the process is called sanctification. That's not a word you hear very often. Justification is what happens when you put your faith in Christ. You are justified. You are declared righteous. You are saved. Glorification comes on the other end of life, and that's when we... That's when our bodies are changed. We're resurrected. We have a perfect heavenly body. No more sickness, sorrow, or pain. That's out in the future. But in the middle, sandwiched between justification and glorification is sanctification. It goes on in this life. It started when you gave your heart to Christ. It's ongoing. It's the process by which you are slowly transformed into the very image of Jesus. And, and all things are used by God to help bring that about. And, and we get impatient with ourselves and we get very impatient with other people because it seems like it takes forever. We like to put everything in a microwave and as soon as we put it in there, God takes it out and puts it in the crock pot. He says, not so fast. It takes a while for slow cooking. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Now, you started. You put your faith in Christ. Now, keep on going. Don't stop now. It's not the end of the journey. It's the end, but it's the front end. You're now to keep on growing into that image. When John F. Kennedy was inaugurated president uh, that day in January 1961, he made his speech and he, he laid out some of the things he wanted to do, some achievements he wanted to accomplish. All presidents do that. And then he, he said this, now this will not be completed in a thousand days. And that's about how long he lived. Not a thousand days or even in our lifetime. But he said, let us begin in November of 1963, he was assassinated. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, went before Congress in the days just after Kennedy's death, and he, he reminded them of Kennedy's dreams, and then he said, let us continue. We've started, now let us continue. And you've started in Christ. Don't stop now. Keep on growing. Now, if that's to happen, this process is to take place. Several things are needed. And that's why I want you to get that listening guide out. You can write these down. There are others, but these I think are the most essential. Number one, you need a balanced diet. A balanced diet. And the diet is the word of God. That Bible you've got in your lap. That's the food. Sometimes it's called milk. That's simple things. Other times it's called meat. That's more complicated things. But that's our diet. And if you're not eating regularly, you're not going to have the strength you need. You're not going to grow strong. You're not going to develop muscles spiritually. And when the testing time comes, you'll fail. Every day you need to be in God's word. Read it. Read it in context. Don't take a verse out of its context. You can make it say anything if you do that. Read it in context. Memorize it, and you can do that. You used to do that, and you memorize other things. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Little chunks of Scripture. Meditate on What is God saying to me in these verses? And then, just as important as any of that, share it. You will remember it when you have shared it. Tell somebody. I, I hope every Monday somebody in this city is talking about what they learned at First Baptist Church the day before. In Bible fellowship or in the worship services. As you share it, it will become more real for you. A balanced diet. Number two, you need companions. You can't do this by yourself. You can't be a Christian by yourself. Now, you come to Christ individually. I know that. But you can't be a Christian by yourself. Friday was All Hallows Day. Thursday before is All Hallows Eve or Halloween. November 1, All Hallows Day or All Saints Day. 
and people around the world who are Christian were remembering saints. And in some traditions, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, saints are very, very special Christians. They're the best of the best. And uh, usually they look for miracles attached to their life. So they, they earn the status of saints and they revere them for that. We don't, we don't look at it that way. For us, for Baptists, every Christian is a saint. That means you are. Doesn't mean necessarily that you always live a saintly life, but you're a saint because the word means set apart. It's the same root as the word sanctification we talked about a moment ago. So you are set apart for Christ. Just like last night, uh, Sandy and Jill spoke some words of sacred covenant and from then on, they are set apart for each other. When you gave your life to Christ and then followed the Lord in baptism, as you saw those precious children do this morning, when that happened, you were set apart forever after as belonging to Jesus. You were made a saint. But I've noticed something. In the New Testament, you never see that word in the singular. It's always in the plural. Another reminder that you can't be a saint all by yourself. We need each other. Predatory animals know if they want to get that deer out of the herd, they look for one that's strayed a bit. It's the animal that's pulled away from the others that is vulnerable. And then the animals, the lions, or the coyotes surround them and take that animal down. The devil comes at you and me like that. And if we get away from the herd, if we try to live this all by ourselves, then we are vulnerable to Satan's attacks. We need companions. And number three, we've got to get control of our schedules. We've got to get control of our schedules, our time. Now, you know about time. We changed our clocks. You did, didn't you? You know what time it is, don't you? You changed your clock. That was so easy to do. Changing our schedule, though, is more difficult. But our schedules can so control us that we've left God out completely. I like what Annie Dillard once said. How we spend our days is how we spend our lives. Look at any day or two in your life. What's going on? What are you doing with your time? Because before you know it, that will be your life. Carl Jung said that hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. And we so fill up our days always running this way and that way that we don't have time for God. I don't know how this sounds to you. I know where we live and I know you work hard and you're your time is so often not your own. I don't know how to tell you to do this, but please find a way to carve out some time for just you and God. It might be early in the morning. That, that seems to be the best for most people, but maybe not for you. But find a time when you can get with God's Word and God's Spirit and let Him speak something into your heart. It's like eating breakfast. It's this healthy diet of the Word of God in time and it works its way into your life. Then you need something else. You need worthy mentors. Worthy mentors. You had one for your career. How about one for your spiritual life? Somebody who's been a Christian longer or maybe is a deeper Christian than you has learned some things you'd like to know how to do. Attach yourself to that person. Get their permission but attach yourself to that person and let them help you. Paul the Apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Pretty bold statement from the old guy. Follow me as I follow Jesus. Well, find somebody who's really following Jesus and follow them for a little bit. We need worthy mentors. You won't find anybody that does it perfectly and the closer you get to them, no man is a hero to his valet, somebody once said. The closer you get to anybody, you'll see their flaws, but they can still teach you something about faith and life. Then we need a better way of thinking. 
As a man thinketh, so is he. What gets our attention eventually gets us. So it's what we put in our brains that's going to determine, to a large degree, the kind of Christian we are. So we've got to change the way we think. Sometimes, very easily, we slip into negativity. Sometimes impurity. Things grab us. We get down. And when we see that happening, that's when we have to change our way of thinking. Change the picture on your computer screen to reflect something like what you want to be. Philippians, again. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I love these words from the apostle. Chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true... Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Well, there's a list. You could add some other things, but think of something pure. Not something nasty. Think of something pure and have that at the ready. Something right. Something true. Have it ready. And when you find the negative thoughts coming, when you find the impure thoughts invading, shift over to those. This isn't going to solve every problem. But if you start thinking differently, you'll live differently. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, murder starts with anger adultery starts with lust it's in the mind so deal with the mind change your way of thinking and then the last there could be others but the last I would bring to you focused worship focused worship you're worshiping right now we've been singing and praying and we're reading God's word we do this on Sundays But you need to be worshiping every day. Focused time on Jesus alone and worship and adore him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. He's saying the longer you focus on Jesus and you you concentrate on him, and that's what we do in worship, the longer you focus on Jesus, you may not see it happen, but it's happening. You are being changed into his very image. And remember, point number one, that's our pursuit, Christ-likeness. Well, it happens as we contemplate Jesus. And keep him always before us. Now how are you going to know if this is happening? Any one day of the week you might not see it. But what's the proof? The proof that it's happening. How do you know if you're on track? And I would suggest three things. Number one, you're on track when you start responding to things the way Jesus did. When you start responding the way Jesus did. And we've got the record. It's that book, that Bible, milk and meat of the word that we're in every day. Remember, we're reading it for a balanced diet. The record is there. So read how Jesus faced things. And then see if it's beginning to happen in your life. Most notably, when you are injured, when somebody hurts you, when you face slander, when you feel under attack, how did Jesus respond? He said, if you're struck on one cheek, turn to that person the other. Turn the other cheek. And he lived it. He actually did that. When he was hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Respond the way Jesus responded. In any situation, with children, with people in need, uh, respond that way. The second thing, it was in our original text this morning, humility. Humility. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was God, did not cling to that, but emptied himself became a servant and went all the way to the cross. He humbled himself. And so we are to walk in humility, not 
vain conceit, but walk humbly before God and humbly before others. And then here's the last thing. You can tell if it's happening if you find yourself drawn to other people. Drawn to other people. Instead of living just for yourself and thinking only about your needs, you find yourself being drawn to people and their needs and and you want to do something about it. That's Jesus. That's what he did. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to heal the sick, even to raise the dead. He emptied himself that he might give himself for others. And he's calling you and me to do the same thing. When we see somebody in need, we're to help. Every time I get ready to talk about this, God surprises me with a test. And I don't always do very well with it. And it happened again this morning. And I should have known, I should have been expecting it, but I didn't at first. Early, early this morning, I went to my usual place to get my coffee, to get ready for the day. And as I'm walking in to the fast food place, there's a man standing there. And he asked me if I'd buy him a cup of coffee. And I said no. And walked right by him, dressed in my Sunday best. I I walked right by him into the restaurant. And as I'm standing there, suddenly this comes to my mind and I realized what I had done. I don't suppose I'd be telling you this if the story didn't end differently. So I'll tell you how it ended. <laughs> I just kept it to myself. But, but I said, Lord, if you give me another chance, I want to help that man. And at that moment, he walked in and he came to me again. And he said, could you buy me a cup of coffee? And this time I was ready And I said, yes, gave him the money, we bought the coffee. I fail so often, but I want to be like Jesus. I I want to be Christ-like, but if I'm going to be Christ-like, it's not just going to be when I'm in this building walking around, spending time with you. It's going to be when I'm out there in the world where there's so many needs, and that's when I've got to respond the way Jesus did, and so do you. Don't look upon yourself just as the recipient of God's grace, Bruce Frank says. We all understand that. We've received his grace. But look upon yourself as one who is to be a carrier of that grace. We've received it freely. We are to give it freely to others. And in the process, we're becoming more and more every day like Jesus. Bow with me, please. Would you please bow your head and close your eyes? In the first service, a lovely young woman came forward saying she wanted to be a part of our church and everybody was excited to welcome her. Maybe today you're ready to also present yourself for membership. You've been coming to First Baptist and you you really like what's happening here and what happens in your life when you're here. Why don't you step out and make that same decision? You saw some folks baptized today. Maybe that's what you need to do. Next time it can be you, but come forward and let us know that you've given your life to Jesus or are willing to do it now that your life might be forever changed. You step out and come. Father, bless now in these moments and may your will be done in this place. Give courage to the one who needs that courage to step out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Thank you. Would you please be seated? Would you please pray with me? In the book of Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. And so, Lord, we will walk in your ways. And we'll stand on the shoulders of those saints who've come before us. We'll lean on your understanding, Father God, and not ours. And we'll conform ourselves to the likeness of Christ, who's our hope, our peace, and our strength. Lord God, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. And may the tithes and offerings that we give bring honor to your name. Amen. <clears throat> 